Senator Marco Rubio, how are you, sir? I'm well. How are you, Mark? I'm doing great. We just kind of bump into each other at these different places uh, <laughs> here and there. And uh, Anyway, I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, it amazes me how the public's attention is diverted so easily, and yet this Veterans Administration scandal, this can't be diverted forever. You, you have a proposal for addressing this, don't you? It's a very simple proposal. It's one that's already passed the House, including with about 160 Democrats voting for it. And what it says is that the Secretary of the VA can fire an executive who isn't performing his job. I know people might be shocked to know that, that they can't do that right now. And the question I most often get is, why don't we do that for the entire government, which is actually a very valid point. But at a minimum, let's start with the VA. And unfortunately, so far, we haven't been able to get a vote on it because Harry Reid is blocking it. Yes, it's it's amazing what uh, what uh, is controversial in Washington D.C. So basically, we have these public sector unions, and Harry Reid is is protecting that. They're not even the public sector union, just a portion of their membership, a tiny fraction of their membership, even though they need the management flexibility to take care of the vets. Is that correct? That's exactly right. Look, we, about a week ago, we had a general fired who was running a military hospital because he wasn't doing his job. Well, you can do that in the military, you can do that in the private sector, but you can't do it at the VA. The secretary cannot fire a senior executive employee who doesn't do his job. In fact, statistics show that you are likelier to get a bonus or a raise than you are to get fired, even if you're not doing your job. There's zero accountability. So it passed overwhelmingly in the House with, as I said, 160 Democrats voting for it. We've got 11 Democratic co-sponsors in the Senate. All the Republicans are on it, and uh, we can't even get a vote on it. You know, this Harry Reid runs the Senate like a dictator, and the fact of the matter is you can't get a vote on it because it would pass. Isn't that correct? It would pass overwhelmingly if we got it. And I believe eventually we will if we continue to ratchet up pressure to get it done. But, um, but again, he, he, uh, he just won't allow anything uh, to be voted on. We spent all week voted on, voting on judges and this and that, but, but nothing on things of meaning, of significant meaning like uh, this accountability issue that, that we're, we're going to continue to work on getting uh, a vote on here in the Senate. What do you make of Obama and uh, this, this fellow that, uh, that they swapped? I mean, Marco Rubio, these, these are five of the worst terrorists on the face of the earth. They're responsible together for the deaths of hundreds, if not thousands. They're going to go back to the field of combat. What the hell is going on here? It's it's like a bad horror movie. You wake up every day and something else has happened that you can't believe would have happened. Uh, you're right about Let me tell you, these five guys are going to be back on the battlefield sooner rather than later. The administration themselves would admit that. It's terrible from that perspective. You have now created an incentive. You've sent a message to try to, to, to our enemies to try to capture American men and women serving in uniform because if you do, that you can trade them for something of value to you. And uh, so that's problematic as well. And then last, not, last but not least, he didn't. He, he violated the law in the way he did this. By law, if you, before you release anyone from Guantanamo, you have to notify Congress with 30 days' notice. He just completely ignored it and moved on and did it. So those are three, you know, just compelling reasons for why how outrageous this truly is. And let me explain why this has happened. By the way, this is part of a political messaging exercise. If you recall, last Monday he flew in on Memorial Day to Afghanistan. Nothing wrong with that commander-in-chief visiting the troops, but then he came back and gave the speech at West Point, and then he did this. This was a plan. It, it, this was all part of a political messaging plan, and this was the third part of it. I don't think they accounted for how outraged the American people would be about the fact that five anti-American terrorist killers will soon be fighting against us again. And he says the end of hostilities. Did he tell the enemy this is the end of hostility? Have that's, they bought into this? Yeah. Did we sign that's some right. peace agreement? That's what I wrote today in the USA Today. I said, you know, the, we may think the war is over, but no one's bothered to tell the Taliban. They, uh, they, we're, they're still at war with us, and so is al-Qaeda, and so is all of these other Islamic fundamentalist radicals around the world. And, uh, you know, my biggest fear for that region of the world is if you try to project forward a couple of years, Afghanistan could quickly deteriorate to looking the way it did on September 10th of 2001, before 9-11. Uh, Syria has become a breeding ground for foreign fighters and radical terrorists to operate from. Libya has degraded significantly. You see terrorist activities in Egypt. You see this unity government now with Hamas and the Palestinian Authority that refuses to recognize Israel's right to exist. 
Iran has basically gotten a concession, concession from this administration that they have a right to enrich uranium and reprocess plutonium. The Russians and the Chinese have signed an agreement to do a joint venture on oil and gas. They're conducting joint military uh, exercises even as we speak. Everywhere you turn, uh, the world has, has gotten more dangerous because of the fecklessness in the, uh, of this administration and the lack of any sort of strategic foreign policy. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but what of this democracy project? See, I think this, to some extent, uh, has caused some of the problem. You can't impose democratic governments on top of tyrannies. You have to defeat the tyranny, as we did in World War II. Um, I, don't, I don't know how you can do these things simultaneously, and, and that's why I think these things are not going to hold. Yeah, so uh, there's two aspects of it. One is, why do you get involved in these conflicts? Primarily, it should be because of our national security interests. So, you know, we want to defeat the Taliban. We want to defeat al-Qaeda. You would love to see these countries emerge into mature democracies, but you're right, you can't impose that on anybody. You certainly want to help people that want to do that, but at the end of the day, it's up to them to make it happen. I think stability is very important. Um, and, again, in many of these parts of the world, what you're seeing is instability. And when the instability comes, what happens now, we'll take the case of Syria for a moment. Because the Assad regime does not control the entire country, there are now vast areas of that country that, are, that have no government. And so now all these foreign fighters, these jihadists, they're coming in from everywhere, including one guy from Florida who detonated a, a, a suicide bomb the other day. They're coming from all over Europe. They're you know, coming from the U.S., and they're coming from, of course, all of the Middle East. And they're using Syria as a training ground. And I'm telling you, so that it's on the record, there will come a day, I fear sooner rather than later, where a terrorist plot, trained for and orchestrated in Syria will be carried out against the U.S. somewhere around the world or even here in our homeland. Well, I look at Syria. Let's just for a moment piece that out. I wouldn't even know what to do about it now. What would you do about Syria now? Well, at this point, obviously, the options are much more limited. In the ideal scenario, what you wanted to do is to ensure that the rebellion in Syria happened irrespective of the U.S., right? Assad is a killer, anti-American terrorist. And there are Syrians that didn't like him, and they took up arms, including many who defected from their army. What happened, though, is that because those people were not able to consolidate themselves, it created a space for all these radical jihadists to come in from other countries and set up camp. And so today in Syria, the most organized, the best armed, and the most deadly groups on the ground are radical jihadist groups. And you see that uncertainty spreading into Iraq. But let me tell you where else you're going to see it soon, in Jordan. And Jordan is an important American ally, an important ally of Israel. And, uh, and they're starting to feel some of the pressure of these radical groups coming across the border and, and, and potentially threatening them and the kingdom. In the meantime, today, uh, our, the administration, our government, has uh, lifted for another six months the ability of the uh, Iranian regime to sell oil. Did you see that? Yeah, this is part of this effort to cut a deal with the Ayatollah uh, to, to on this nuclear process. Yes, but he announced last week that his, that their whole goal is to destroy the United States. He said it himself. Yeah. Well, every Friday of Friday prayers, it ends with the chant, death to Israel, death to America. That hasn't changed. The other thing that hasn't changed is they continue to develop long-range rockets. And you, you, the reason why they want to build long-range rockets is to one day threaten the U.S. homeland. They continue to sponsor terrorism all over the world. No country on earth spends more money on sponsoring terrorism than Iran does. In the middle of all of this, they continue to do all of these activities. And we have now, basically, in these negotiations, the administration has agreed to recognize their right to enrich. And if you can enrich uranium, it doesn't matter what level you're enriching uranium now. If you know how to enrich it and you've got the equipment to enrich it, any day you decide to flip the switch and, and make it weapons grade, you can do that. And at the, even by the own admission of this own administration, they are going to leave Iran with a legitimate, recognized international right to enrich uranium. And, and eventually, when, when they decide to do it, build a bomb that could threaten Israel and ultimately the United States. One of the things that troubles me greatly here is I see we've been negotiating with the Taliban. We have just recognized the, the joint, uh, what do they call it, the temporary technical joint government that is, the Hamas now, Palestinian uh, entity, whatever it is, um, I see um, uh, members of the Muslim Brotherhood meeting in the Oval Office. I see us lifting six for no another six months uh, the ability of the, the regime in Tehran to sell oil. What are we doing here? This administration came in with the idea that if we were nicer to people, the reason why they hated us was because we were too involved, because we were too stern 
because they hated George W. Bush, whatever it may be, and that if we were nicer to them, that they would then stop being terrorists. And you see how silly that is. And there are parts of this world, the Middle East being one of them, where sometimes this language of reconciliation is viewed as, as an invitation to become even more aggressive. And, and that's what's happening here in place after place. And, um, you know, with regard to what you just pointed to with, with Iran, I mean, they don't, they view like they're coming at this from a, a position of strength. And uh, they think that Obama is desperate for a deal. And in their mind, they win either way. You know, these sanctions are now going to be very difficult to reimpose in the future. Uh, if the talks fail, or the talks don't fail, at least from their perspective, they're going to have an internationally recognized right to enrich uranium, which means when they decide to enrich it to weapons grade, there'll be nothing we can do about it. Now, Senator Marco Rubio, you're going to have to be prepared to answer this question now wherever you go, and I suspect you are. But let me ask it, since I was one of your early supporters for the Senate. You remember that, by the way? I do. I just, I just, want, to, I just want to ask you this. It's pretty obvious you're seriously thinking, if not organizing, to run for president, a potential run. Is that accurate? You know, Mark, I don't know if that's fully accurate in the sense that I uh, certainly I have to make a decision by the end of this year because I'm up for re-election in Florida. So I have to make a decision. I think something that every pub, somebody in public office should ask themselves, do I want to continue to serve in office for the right reasons or is it time for me to do something else? I certainly I feel an incredible debt to this country because it has made available to me opportunities that no generation in my family ever had before me. They never could have done that in any part of the world. And I love serving the country. And if I have an opportunity to do so in a higher office, I will consider it seriously. Right now, my focus between now and November is to get rid of Harry Reid as the majority leader. It is a miserable experience. It is damaging to the country, deeply damaging to the country. We are now, as a matter of routine, confirming to the bench and to the cabinet and to other executive agencies uh, people with radical political views that are setting this country back. You look at what's happening at the EPA. You look at what's happening at the Labor Department. Some of this damage they're doing is going to take a decade or longer to, to, to reverse. But you can't so, stop them in the Senate because he's destroyed the filibuster rule. Well, but if we're in the majority in the Senate, we can't stop these things from moving forward. And at a minimum, stop the damage and then hopefully begin to rebuild our Well, country. now, let me slow you down. I heard McConnell or somebody announce that they're going to put this 60-vote rule back in place for these appointments. And that would be extremely foolish, in my view, uh, while Obama's in office. I think you need to teach Reid and the rest of them a lesson. And then when it's over, it's over, and then you go back to the 60 vote. But to just capitulate immediately, I think, is a huge mistake. Well, that's a valid conversation for us to consider, given what they've done. But I can tell you it won't matter in the short term, because you won't be able to appoint judges that are radicals or uh, member agency heads that are radicals, because they won't, they won't have a majority to even offer them. So it, it just looks, have, it, have it, you it, looked it, around it, your caucus lately? There's a few of them who will buckle. Well, I hope not. I hope that if this election comes through the way we hope it will, and if you look around the country at what's happening at the quality candidates, you know, Joni Ernst last night won her election in Iowa. She's going to be a great senator. Tom Cotton in Arkansas, Cory Gardner in Colorado. Sass. We've got great candidates all over the country. you got Sass in Nebraska. That's, that's a sharp ben dude Sass there. Sass in Nebraska is a, is a guy who's going to come in and be a leader from day one. I mean, you talk about a guy with executive experience running a university, also kind of his background is, is very intelligent. And, and there are others that I'm probably missing here. We've got a great group of candidates, and, and I think they, you know, one of the things I'm interested in, I don't just want people that are going to come up here and vote right. I want people that are going to come up here and, 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 and make a difference. And I think you talked about Ben. There are a couple others that are going to come up here and do that. So we're excited about that. You don't need to comment, but we want to send you one from Mississippi, too. La Marco Rubio, <laughs> God bless you, my friend. I appreciate Thanks. you coming on. Be safe out there. Thanks for what you do. Thank you. All right. Take care now.